Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I want to talk about this because you know what? So many times we, we hear um, stories like what we heard last week. And if you were here, awesome. If you weren't, watch live stream. But we hear all these different stories of, of, of just living in a challenged world. And, uh, and then tragedy happens and then we all get moved and we all want to do something but isn't it amazing how how um, we're quick to start something but not very good at finishing things and God wants us to finish what he started in us God wants to finish what he started in you he didn't just save you so that you can say oh great now I have a ticket to heaven praise God he didn't give us this helmet of salvation to say, wow, you know what, now my mind's protected. No, God, God gave. He, he went into full action. When we see John 3, 16, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just a verse or a message of love. It was a message of, I'm going to do something about it because you know what, I love you that much. And, and, and we see all throughout the scriptures that the word is really meant to, to, to help us develop conviction. Everybody say with me, Conviction. Conviction is something that we got to talk about. Everyone here in this room has conviction. Even a thief has conviction. His conviction is, I got to rob people. <laughs> yeah, it's true. If you ask a, a, a thief, does it bother you? No, man, it doesn't bother me. Everyone has conviction whether it's right or wrong. But when you come to Christ at some point, God wants to develop some God conviction inside of you. God wants us to take the principles that he's given us through his word, and then he wants us to not only be hearers of his word, but then he wants us to take that word, and he says, now, Mauricio, I need you to apply it, because when you begin to apply it, that's when your conviction goes into action. And when that conviction goes into action, that's when real transformation starts happening, not only in your life, but also in the lives of people that are around you. I was talking to a couple right before service. I'm not sure if they're in this service here, but they were telling me that the way they came to church was because uh, they had visited one time um, and they brought one of their children. And I guess the little boy loved our church and he only remembered our church as the fish church, <laughs> the goldfish church. <laughs> Mommy, take me to the goldfish church. And that's how mom came back to God. And then that's how then dad came also back to God. The conviction of a child. It's so interesting how the Bible says that out of the mouth of babes will come great strength. D do you hear what I'm saying? Your children right now are developing conviction right now as we speak. Whether it's good or bad. But everybody is moved by conviction. As a matter of fact, let me give you a quick definition of conviction. Look up here in the screens real quick. Conviction is the act of convincing a person of error or of compelling the admission of a truth. That's, that's conviction for you right there. You're, you're trying to, to, to convince a person that, hey, listen, man, dude, what you're doing, robbing people is not good. It's not good for, 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 for this, this, the, the, the earth. It's not good for people. It's unhealthy for you. It's, it's not. And so you're trying to convince the person that you're in error. But it's also something that we compel. We used to compel the admission of, of a truth and just bring people the truth of God because the truth is the only thing that can make us free. And, and you know what? I, I, I think that right now more than ever, there has become a serious but dangerous trend in churches. Let me explain myself because I'm also talking about Elevate Church. There is a trend happening right now in the body of Christ of people who go to church and, and then they leave church and they'll make statements like this, like all of us have. Have you ever said something? If, if you have, just say amen, okay? This isn't to expose you. This is to have some fun right now. You know what? You, you leave service and, and you're like, dang, man, pastor read my mail. Y'all lying in church. Let me do this again. Amen if you've ever said this. Dang, pastor read my mail. 
okay, or you leave a service, whether it's at Elevate or anywhere else, and you're like, dang, that message just nailed the coffin, right? Just nailed me real good. It's exactly what I needed, right? Other people have done this where they leave a service and they're like, oh my God, man, I am wrecked for new and just like crying. And then someone else cries <laughs> and we pray together. Yeah, we got this finally. Uh, have you ever seen people like that? Meaning you, right? And we leave services and we're weeping and we're like hearing Dennett's story. There was not one dry eye in this place last weekend, man. Everybody was just crying because we just felt for her and also her love for God and her conviction that she trusted God when bullets were flying, right? And we, we, get, we get emotionally moved, but we never really go into action with what we heard. I mean, you even got people that use social media like, dang, oh my God, church was fly. And we start putting little emojis. Have you ever seen some emojis that people put? Let me show you some feelings that people put at church. <laughs> like, <laughs> and we just like put these icons like, oh my God, like, <laughs> then that story was just so awesome. And then we have this one right here. Like, this one's like, oh my God, he's talking about me right now. How about this one right here? How about this one? Like, oh, oh my God, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Booger, snot, everything's coming out, right? Uh, how about this one? Hey, <laughs> all right, amen, pastor. You know that's for them, not me, right? <laughs> Keep going. Next one. Then there's just like, ooh. We have those, and you're, we're going to have some ooh moments today. Just wait. Like, dang, did he really go there? And, and yeah, and then there's this one right here. Come on, man. You're just angry like, ah, like, man, I just can't stand it, pastor, man. He just, why do you have to say that? Now I got to go deal with my spouse when I leave this service, you know. Next one. How about this one? Have you ever felt like chocolate? <laughs> oh, that's chocolate, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Have you ever felt like chocolate? Have you ever felt like fudge? <laughs> huh? You're like, fudge, man. Why do you go there, right? How about this one? Come on, you're like, nah, uh-uh, nah, I, I, I ain't, I ain't, I'm done here in that path, I'm done. I, I'm so done with this church. Have you ever had that? No? You're still here? Hello? Uh, how about this one? Is there any more? Oh, that was it. But that's the reality. We, we live in a society now. There's a trend in churches where all, it's all hype, man. But let's not blame the pastors. Let's not blame the churches. Man, we love to be illustrative. We love to be passionate, excited. But, but listen, but at what point will, will you take the word and, and then begin to really, for real, like for real, apply that word and, and take it from like it's my conviction to now it becomes the action which then becomes my renewal, and then my renewal begins to bring transformation, and then I always really start seeing fruit, because if not, then we got really nice, good Christians that are struggling with the same thing, and when you talk to them, it's funny, but it's true. I always hear this, like, yeah, I, I know, Pastor. Yeah, I, I know, but that's the problem. You know so much that it's not even a conviction anymore that brings the, the change that you need, because you've already, you've already, You've grown up, and, and no one can tell you. Not even God can move you anymore. And so we've become a society. We've become a culture of just feelings. Like, I felt, I felt blessed today. Great. That's great. You know, I felt so touched today. Oh, awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad we're all touched. But, but when are we going to go from a feeling into, man, when I walked out and, and that message nailed me, Man, I gotta make a change. I, I have to. I have to take the steps. I have to take the application that is being given to me in church. That's trying to equip me to be the man or the woman that God's calling me to be, and not just be a talker, but to be a walker. That's what God wants for every single one of us. God wants to turn our conviction into action. Are you here with me today? And let me share a story with you real quick because there's two people I'm going to use as an example in the Bible that heard the message from Jesus. Man, this dude went to Elevate Church, and he heard the same sermon that you and I hear. And so Jesus is talking to this guy. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 18, and look, stay with me. Because you know what? Everyone here walks away with different emotions here. Let's just, just stay, stay with me, okay? Just tap your neighbor and be like, how are you feeling right now? You okay? Okay. 
I'm sure some of us can find different emotions throughout the service. We'll see. Okay, Luke 18, verse 18 through 23 says this. It says, a certain ruler asked him, what, what, what kind of person? A certain what? Ruler. So obviously this person was not just a nobody. This person was a person with influence. This person was a person that obviously was in porn. Okay, and, and so we're not just talking about anybody. He says, a ruler asked him, as who? Jesus. He said, good teacher. So he's coming to him and he's asking him a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to be this, this, this Christian, this believer, this follower uh, uh, of you? How do I get all of God in my life? And Jesus responds. <clears throat> and, um, and he says this to him. He says, why do you even call me good, man? I mean, I love the fact that obviously this guy approaches him with like maybe some, some self-righteousness. But Jesus just immediately brings the truth and he brings the gospel in such a very simple way. He says, hey, listen, no one's good, man. Why do you even call me good? He says, God alone is good. He's good. And so if you're here today and maybe you're not in a good place, guess what? Jesus would say, like, that's okay, man. No, no, there is no one good. But we're good because we're with God. And with God, you can be good. And so he says, uh, no one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Ain't that funny, huh? The young rich ruler, he comes and asks Jesus something he already knew. He's like, you know the commandments. How many of us already know what to do? But we don't do it. You're going through something. You know your challenge. You know your struggle. You know what to do because you've heard it before. Someone has ministered to you about it before. You've heard a message on it. And you've, 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 you've bought the, the, the sermon. You've got the T-shirt. And, and, and you were all in. And then for whatever reason, you just kind of forgot about it. Why? Because you know what? The word was not able to go deep in long enough to become rooted inside of you. And then therefore the enemy comes and takes anything that doesn't get rooted in you. And so he says, you already know the commandments, bro. What are you asking me? But he tells him, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You must honor your father and your mother. And he says, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. In other words, this kid is saying, let me tell you something. I grew up in the church. My parents were pastors. I went to church every single weekend, man. Man, I, I, I went to children's ministry. I went to youth ministry. Man, I went to young adults ministry. I went to singles ministry. I went to Bible study. Man, I did all that in a bag of tortillas, right? <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus looks at this guy, obviously, who had some pride. Do you know that the, the only reason most of us don't change is because of pride? It's really just pride. You know why? Because if you think you don't need change, then we're talking about you and me. And so he's very proud. He's like, I've already, I've already done that. Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> and Jesus says, well, listen, uh, well, in all honesty, uh, you lack one thing. You see, every single one of us, we're lacking one thing right now in our life. In other words, you never arrive. We're always lacking one thing. And so he says, you're, you're lacking one thing. And he says to him, sell everything you have. Now, here's the message, right? Now, he's telling him what to do. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Let's stop right there. When, when you give up, when you sacrifice, when, when you let go something that, that is precious to you, you don't, you don't trade down with God. You trade up with God. God. God gives you more. Whatever you sow, God says, I'll do double of what you gave. That's, that's God's conviction. That's his principle. And so he says, sell everything you have and you will have treasure in heaven. In other words, Man, once you sell it all, he, didn't, he, didn't, he couldn't understand that God was not only going to give him treasure in heaven. God would have gave him double of what he already had on earth. And then look what it says. And he says, then I want you to come follow me. In other words, you got to get, get over yourself. Let go of your ideas. Let go of whatever it is that's holding you. And then come and follow me. And isn't that the struggle with most Christians is following Jesus? See, we'll follow Jesus only to the extent 
where it doesn't require sacrifice. Once it requires me to give up something, what happens to us is what happened to this guy. Look what he says. When he what? Come on, church, work with me here today. And when he what? Purpose. When he what? Purpose. When he what? Purpose. When you hear messages every week here at Elevate Church, when he heard this, he became what? Dang. The, the gospel is called good news. If you get sad when you leave Elevate Church after hearing a message, because we don't condemn in this place. We inspire, we encourage, we correct, we instruct, we rebuke sometimes, but then we love you again and say, you can do this, right? But this guy, he's hearing from the, the man himself. Jesus himself is telling him, this is what you can do to inherit everything that God has for you on earth and in heaven. And he hears this, and he left very sad. Stay with me. He left sad. He had the emoji of sadness. Show the emoji of sadness. So he left very, very sad. Look at that. Just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a, a tear of healing. That's a tear of, I don't want to lose anything. Go back to my verse. And so he left very sad because he was very what? Wealthy. The goal is not to get you sad when we preach the gospel. The goal is not to have you leave church and say, man, I'm not the Christian I should be. Man, I'm not really the woman I really should be. I'm not really the father that I need. That's not, the goal is the good news should inspire you. It should challenge, it should confront you to say, you know what? Wow, praise God that I'm still alive, that I still have lungs in me, and I can make a change today. Amen. Huh? Amen. Come on, do you guys remember Michael Jackson, Man in the Mirror? <laughs> yeah, right? He says, I have to look at the man in the mirror, right, so I can what? Make a change. Yes. Yes. And I'm sounding like Michael Jackson right now inside my head, I promise you. <laughs> inside my head, I'm just like, <laughs> I mean, I like, it's like, I, I wish you could see what's going on in my head right now. I mean, I'm straight up just like, just like, <clears throat> you know, just, it, but I can't do it. <laughs> and, and so, and so, and so what God wants is here every, every time you open the Bible, God is bringing you a message. He's bringing you a message. And, and, and so many of us are walking away from that message, that word sad. It, it's not a message of sadness. The Bible is a message of hope. It's a message of victory. It's a message of power. It's a message of enlightenment. It's a message of, of strength, a message of wisdom. Uh, it's a message that, that, that wants to take you and I to another level it want, the word wants to elevate you and, and so many times how is it that that we're not able to to get a god conviction to realize that god's not trying to take something from you he's trying to get something to you now look at not even not even not even very long after these little verses in the very next chapter he gives us another story of a different guy look at this go with me uh to uh luke chapter 19 and, and let me tell you something, the, 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 the young rich ruler, it's not, that he, it's not that he couldn't change, guys. It's that he wouldn't change. See, it's not that you can't change. You know, nobody needs to tell you that you need to change. You know what you need to change right now in your life. And, and it's not that you can't, it's just that you won't. The young rich ruler, he could have changed right there, but he wouldn't do it. You know what? Jesus obviously was not compelling enough to bring him the truth that would bring his, the change that he really needed. Man, I wonder what would have happened if he would have just said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I, I'll sacrifice this. Because you know what? When, when God's asking you to do something, it never makes natural sense. It just doesn't like, how's that going to work for me? And look, so now we have this, this other guy that he, literally, we have Luke 18, young rich ruler, and immediately Luke 19, verse 1. Look at this. And Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a what? Chief tax collector. Okay, another guy with influence. Now, mind you, in these days, if you were a chief tax collector, if that was your, your career, you were dirty, man. Man, they, this was the IRS of their time. 
okay? But these guys were dirty. They would rip you off. Man, they would put your family in jail. If you didn't pay the taxes that you were supposed to pay, if you didn't take care of the things that you need, they would literally put your children and your children's children in prison until you paid every single dime back. So this is, just so you understand, it wasn't just some dude named Zacchaeus. No, this dude was a chief sinner. And I don't know where you come from. Maybe you're here at this church and, and, and you're thinking, man, uh, Christians are just so, they're so condemning and they're just so, uh, you know, finger pointing. And you're right. There is a lot of Christians like that. Like they're just looking for flaws and, and just looking to say something arrogant about you. And, and, but, but here's the deal. That's not the way Jesus rolls. And so look, so there's this chief tax collector, and he was what? Wealthy. So here you have the young rich ruler. He was what? Wealthy. Here you have this guy. He was a chief. This guy was a ruler. This guy was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. So both guys, they have the same influence. They have, they have the same financial status. They're both wealthy. But there's, there's something about this guy. Pay attention. And so this guy named Zacchaeus, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, man, he could not see over the crowd. Come on, if you're short, you're blessed, bro. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Stop tripping. You'd be a short, wealthy person. And, and so, so here you have Zacchaeus. He knows, listen, he knows that he is shrewd. But check this out. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. And since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Man, what's wrong with you? Get over here, boy. I must stay at your pad today. And all the haters, hate, hate are the Christians. They start saying this. Look at this. All the people saw this and they began to what? Mutter. He has gone to, the, to be the guest of a sinner. Man, I bet there were people there that had been done wrong by this dude. And, and, and they're just like, this guy, this guy, man, he hurt my family. Man, this guy, he lied about our family. Man, this guy, I mean, just think about the chief tax collector. He was, he was evil, period. And yet Jesus is willing to go and stay at this guy's house. And, and, but, but, but here's the difference. Pay attention. Look. And so, um, but Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, immediately said, Lord, look. He says, Lord, look. Look. Here and now. Everybody say, here and now. Here look, now. Check this out. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Right now. Jesus walks into your house and the conviction hits him. And he says, Right here, right now, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And look, he goes on to say this. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Stay with me. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to your house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and say that which was lost. What, what's the point here? The difference between the young rich ruler and Zacchaeus is that one left sad and the other one left changed. Jesus walks in, boom, immediately. He says, Lord, Lord, here's what's going to happen. I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give half. He immediately took his conviction. He was convicted that Jesus, knowing that he's a sinner, he walked into his house. He knows that he's dirty. He's filthy. He knows that he's been just a horrible human being on earth. But the presence of Jesus brought him so much conviction that immediately right there he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a change. I'm going, I'm going to take whatever I have and I'm going to split it in half and I'm going to give it to the poor and anyone that I have cheated, I'm going to give them back four times what I stole from them. Talk about a holy conviction. Talk about the difference of someone in church who's been around so long, who leaves sad because you know you haven't changed, but you're still not changing. And then someone who hears the same word and says, God, you know what? Please forgive me. Lord, here's what I'm going to do. Man, I'm going to start 
reading my word and I'm going to start applying this word. God, I'm going to start praying to you and talking to you. I'm going to start connecting with you. God, when I come to worship on time, <laughs> some of us don't even have the conviction to be in church on time. Let me say that again. <laughs> and I always hear this, oh, it's because the kids. No, it's you. You're the kid. Oh, wow. Because if you were the parent, you would be here on time. Put my emoji up right now. You know which one. <laughs> no, oh, that, that one works too. Because I know I got some parents right now feeling like that about me. That's okay. Talk smack. That's okay. That's all right. I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that one, that one's really like, whoa. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Oh, it's because there's no parking. Oh, it's because my kids. It's because I have four kids. It's, listen, when it's a conviction, it's a conviction. You want God on time, but you can't show up to time, on time for him. You want healing, but you won't show up. Listen, worship, when you worship God, when you're on time and you worship God, God says, wow, my son, my daughter, they really, this church thing is not a trend. This church thing is their conviction. Man, this means something to them. The word means something to them. Come on, when they pray to me, it means something to them. Now, I get it. When we were, when we were kids, listen, when, when we were kids, man, I did what, whatever mom, Isaac, when my mom said something, listen, I don't know about you guys, but Mexican moms, they're a little cray-cray. I, I'm, I'm going to tell my mom. She ain't here today, so it's okay. God was so awesome. He gave us the Holy Spirit. My mom gave us the Holy Chancla, man. We were, like, if my mom said, like, do this, like, it was done. Like, there was no, you don't talk back to a Hispanic mom or black moms either. You know, it, I mean, my mom literally would take that Holy Chancla and she would literally, I mean, she would express every vow. I done told you, you do not, not. And she would just, and it would be like, God, mom. And then, of course, the holy chancla put the fear in me. And, and listen, I, had, I didn't have the fear of God. I had the fear of mom. And, and I, it, her convictions became my convictions. But it was, done, it was done in a very improper way. But here's the reality. Man, when you already know that there's some accountability, man, you're going to do it. But how many know that at some point, listen, you got to go from mommy and daddy conviction to you have to have your own personal convictions where you have to start making some grown-up decisions and start taking charge of your life. Are you hearing me? God wants us to have our own conviction, our God conviction, in order to see the change that we want to see. And this guy right here, he was willing to walk away with change. Come on, today, you're either walking away sad or you're walking away changed. That's, 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 that's your choice. It's not that you can't. It's that you won't. You can change today. Are you hearing me? Yes. Amen. Because too many of us talk as, as if God is real, but we don't act like he's real. We talk like Israel, yeah, praise God, hallelujah, glory to Man, all things are possible with God, praise God, until it hits you. We need to start acting like he's God, not just talk like he's God. Come on, our conviction leads us to action. We act like he is God. In the midst of whatever turmoil you face, I act like he is in control, though I may be out of control in my life. That's the kind of God... I, I love and I'm witnessing a generation more and more that we're a generation that's just hearing about the word. We just hear the word. We hear podcasts, sermon, and everyone does it. I have my favorite speakers. But, but listen, but if you just hear the word only, be careful. Because if you're only allowing the word to get in your life and nothing else but the word, we have word but no application. See, what will happen is that word will become very stale in you. As a matter of fact, you become very dry. And it just becomes kind of like a, just a routine. You know, people share a scripture with you, and it's kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever. And, and then all of a sudden, man, we can become very callous and very cold when you're just getting the word of God. Listen, God says, Jesus said, I, I am the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus is the word of God. Jesus, even he said, I alone am not enough for you. You know what he said? 
he comes to his disciples and he says, I am now leaving you another what? Helper. So the word is Jesus and the word is powerful, but the only way that you can apply a holy principle in, and, and the word is only by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit helps you apply this word. He helps the application portion of this. How am I going to change? The Holy Spirit. We have to know the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Come on, bro. You can go ahead now. Look at this. Stay with me. 1 Corinthians 8 one says this. Knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant. In other words, we can be that person that always says, I know, I know, I know. Have you ever tried to minister to someone and they just keep telling you, oh, I know. Oh, I know. No, like, no, here's what you need to do. Uh, I, I know. Well, if you knew, then why aren't you doing it? What happens? Hear this. You know about so much that we're now have all this knowledge, but it makes people self-righteously arrogant, but love that is unselfishly seeks the best for others, and it builds up and encourages others to grow in wisdom. In other words, what's this verse saying? Knowledge alone produces arrogance. Knowledge alone produces arrogance. Knowledge alone. Pride is what keeps most people from change. And you have to realize this. But when you add wisdom to knowledge, now it becomes application. And the Holy Spirit is your wisdom. He is the one that will help you bring the change. Look at Romans 12 too quick. It says, don't live any longer the way this world lives because the world has its own convictions. It does. But God doesn't want you to have a world conviction. He wants you to have a God conviction. And so he says, don't live any longer the way this world lives. Let your way of what? Thinking. What's, con what's, convic what's conviction? Conviction is what I do and why I do it. That's conviction. And you know what? Your conviction is, is, is linked with how you think, and how you think is linked with how you behave. And so unless you start allowing the Holy Spirit to help you, then you're not going to be able to have the God change you need because you're only trying to do it with word, with knowledge, but you have no wisdom to apply that knowledge. And so he says, we need to then, then he says, then you'll be able to test what God wants for you and you will agree that what he wants is right. What is, what is conviction? It's God trying to get you to agree to his truth. He says, then you're gonna, then you're gonna start agreeing with what I'm saying to you. Then you're gonna agree that your conviction is not my conviction. God says, there's a conviction that I have I can tell you this, man, the church is one of the most hypocritical places on earth. Haven't you ever noticed that? And I'm talking about us, we, we the church. Come on, have you ever told someone, come on, just forgive them already. Just let it go. Come on, just, just love them through it. But then you have a, you're holding a grudge against someone. Have, have you ever seen that? I had to lovingly have to correct a friend of mine. And, uh, and I said, hey, listen, you, you've been talking over here some pretty harsh stuff but then on this one here you're saying this and you sound you sound double minded like it's kind of hypocritical you're saying here man don't don't flaw people don't 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 be don't mistreat people don't degrade but over here you're you're calling people stupid ignorant dummies i'm like look at your social media what are you saying what are you doing i didn't post it on i wanted to but i did and i went to personal message said hey this is not the person I know you to be. What are you doing? This isn't you. What's wrong with you? It's not what you believe doesn't match up with what you're living. I know, I know, I know. Okay, but do you act upon what you know? Look, and so he says, and you will agree that what he wants is right and his plan is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. And I don't know about you, but man, like any child, we want to please the father. We want to please our mom. We want to please our family. We want, to, we want them to be like, yes. Well, let me tell you something. When you have a God conviction, you want to please the Father. You won't show up late to church. Why? It's my conviction. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that in this family. We, we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't rob God. When he says bring the tithe, 
We bring the tithe. Why? It's my conviction. It's what, it's what if God said it, then so be it. I'm, I'm going to trust you. It's to this day, it doesn't make any natural sense, like how that works, but it works. Like God always provides. Like it's like, wow, God, you're just amazing. The numbers, no matter how many calculators I've tried to use, it never adds up, but he adds it up. God has a supernatural calculator. I don't even, nowadays, like, when it's like, whoa, how do we do that? Don't tell me I don't even want to figure it out. Let's just leave it alone. Praise God. Hey, you know, I don't even want to know how you did it, God. I just, why? It's just my conviction to trust what he said. I just, I, I trust you. Okay, God, give. Okay, I give. God says, open a school. I open a school. But you've never, I've had more people in church. We had families leave our church because I did that. Why? Because their conviction was, no, you need to stay here, do nothing. Do what then? Yeah, just feed us. No, you cray cray. And then they got emoji like this. Give me a cray cray emoji. They got one of these again. Ah! Like, sorry. And then they put it all social media and talk crap about me. That's okay. Because you know what? We all have days where we feel like chocolate. Pastor, how do, I start, how do I stop rebelling against God? How do I stop it? How do I stop just pleasuring me? How do I, stop, how do, I do that? How, how's this going to work? How do I get more of God? Listen, I'm telling you, the word itself alone is not enough. In Titus 3, 5, and 6, I'm already done. It says this, he saved us. Look at this, Jesus, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we have done. Aren't you glad that there's not enough good that you can do on this earth in order for Jesus to save you? He doesn't want performers. He wants kids. And he says, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth. And look at this. And what? Renewal. Renewal. Romans 12 says, and be renewed in your what? Mind. How am I going to renew my mind? It says, and there is a renewal by who? The Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us, what? Generously through who? Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, I'm not enough for you to change. I am going to make you more than enough by my Holy Spirit. You guys getting this? We got too much word, but no change. No change. No more struggling with the same struggle. It's time to change. We got to make a change. Come on. Are you going to leave sad or are you going to leave changed? Are you going to be a young rich ruler? Like, oh, I got to stop cussing. I got to. Or are you going to be a Zacchaeus? Immediately, right now, right here, right now is what he said. Right here, right now, I give half of my money to the poor. Right here, right now, I'm going to. Pay back four times of whatever I cheated of anybody. What if right now, what if right here, right now, right here, right here, right now, here now, if you've been having odd against someone, you're going to go call them today and you're going to apologize for your attitude. Right here, right now. You're going to forgive that person that, that did you wrong. How may I inherit the eternal life? Gotta forgive. Gotta forgive. Go get it right. Call that person today before you leave. Right here, right now. There's gonna be a lot of people on the phones in the back today after service, like, <laughs> Mom, <laughs> I forgive you. Right? You know why? Because the Holy Spirit will always do double the work. You know why? He changes you inside. That's the Holy Spirit. He's the double double for your trouble. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. Why? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and you can read that later, but in John 16, 8, it says, and the Holy Spirit will convict the whole world of its sin. Listen. The Holy Spirit is not here to expose you. The Holy Spirit is here in your life to help you, to heal you, to restore you. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, he has feelings too. But aren't you glad that his emojis look nothing like ours? The Holy Spirit, you know what he does? When you grieve him, he does this. He touches you. He says, stop. Stop. And then he stops the nudge because he wants you to have a right here, right now. I'm going to make the change. Right here. So the Holy Spirit literally, he tells you when you're off. He tells you when you're missing it. He, he keeps you close to the Father. But why is it so difficult to do this? Because Satan wants to separate you from God constantly. Why? Because if you get close to the Holy Spirit and you start having change, man, you know that you're no longer a threat to the end. When you, when you come to Christ, you're a threat to the, to the devil. When you're doing your thing, man, you're not a threat. He hardly even messes with you. Why? Because you do a better job messing it up. So we got to come back to that place of conviction. Let's stand to our feet. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.